Uh, well, good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks very much for joining us. Uh, this is the fifth uh, in a series of uh, webinars uh, that we've been uh, providing. Uh, and these uh, started uh, at the beginning of this uh, you know, COVID uh, uh, pandemic. Uh, and when this started, I have to say that uh, all of us uh, uh, on board uh, would never have predicted that uh, sort of five months into the uh, process, we'd be where we are right now. A number of, thing, of things have uh, you know, happened uh, 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 as a result of this uh, you know, a pandemic. Uh, and one of the um, uh, most notable uh, uh, is the uh, outpouring of uh, uh, concern, uh, uh, advocacy, and unrest uh, having to do with uh, social uh, equity, uh, 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 violence, uh, uh, you know, diversity as a result of the uh, murder of uh, uh, George Floyd. And um, uh, today, uh, the, uh, you know, the topic that we really want to uh, you know, cover is uh, prioritizing uh, you know, health equity. Um, a couple of logistics uh, with this uh, a call. Uh, you do not need video. You do not need a microphone uh, to uh, participate in the call. Uh, you can submit, uh, you know, you know, questions uh, at the, uh, in the uh, uh, question and answer button at the bottom. And uh, we're, we always try to allow for about 20 minutes at the uh, end of this uh, session uh, to answer those uh, questions. Uh, if you choose to uh, attach your name uh, to a question and we don't have time to get to the answer, uh, we will uh, get back to you uh, uh, personally with an email uh, with an answer. And so we're fortunate today uh, to uh, have put together a really a remarkable panel uh, being led by uh, uh, Peter Slavin, uh, the president of the hospital, and, and Peter uh, needs no introduction. Uh, uh, Joe Betancourt. Uh, uh, Joe is a vice president and uh, also holds the uh, title of a chief equity and inclusion officer. Uh, Joe's been with us for a, a number of years and has been the uh, leader and director of the, uh, 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 the uh, diversity and uh, equity uh, you know, solutions uh, center. Joe will be followed by uh, Dr. Katrina Armstrong. Uh, uh, Katrina is a chief of medicine and holds the title of physician in chief at a, a Mass General uh, Hospital. And following uh, Katrina, uh, we have Dr. Aisha James. Uh, uh, Dr. James has uh, just finished uh, her uh, chief residency uh, in the, uh, the Department of Medicine. Uh, in that role, Aisha played a, a central role in terms of uh, uh, staffing and the logistics around uh, you know, treating the uh, COVID-19 uh, surge. And we've uh, fortunate that she has now joined our, our primary care faculty. So, uh, without further ado, uh, Peter, I'm going to turn things over to you. Thank you very much, Britt, and uh, thank you all so much for uh, participating in this uh, webinar. We appreciate your interest in what's going on at Mass General and your support of our institution as well. Uh, I've been associated with the hospital now for 36 years. It's uh, 36 years ago that I started my residency in, in Katrina's Department of Medicine. She wasn't the uh, chief at that time, but uh, that, that's where my career at the MGH began. And, uh, and I've always, every day since then, been so proud of being associated with this institution, but never more so than over the last uh, five months as the institution has really unleashed all of its capabilities in the fight against uh, COVID-19. Uh, just to go back a few months, uh, in the third week of April, uh, we were caring for about 350 uh, inpatients with COVID-19. I'm pleased to say that that number uh, now in the last week of July is down to about 10. So we've seen a dramatic decrease in the uh, number of inpatients with COVID-19 needing our services. What's also been remarkable is that uh, we've seen a transformation of our outpatient care uh, prior to COVID-19, almost none of our outpatient care was delivered virtually through telemedicine, and now about half of it is being done through that uh, technology. Uh, thanks to Katrina and others, we've launched a major research effort against COVID-19, including vaccines, therapeutics, diagnostics, uh, et cetera. That, that's really been amazing to watch as the hospital's uh, research uh, focus has, uh, has uh, taken on this, uh, this virus with such abandon. Uh, and I guess the other part of the story I wanted to mention, which is perhaps most relevant to the topic today, is that thanks to student observation on the medical service early during this pandemic, we recognize, whereas uh, under 
typical circumstances, 15% of our inpatients at Mass General are Spanish speaking, that about half of our patients uh, in being admitted with COVID-19 were Spanish speaking. And we're coming from the communities of Chelsea, Revere, East Boston, some of the lower income communities that surround the hospital. And, uh, and so that uh, made it very clear uh, that the uh, social determinants of health were uh, sort of wreaking havoc in these uh, communities as they do all the time, but, but it was made all the more dramatic uh, during this uh, pandemic. Um, that, that unleashed on our part a, a massive uh, community health uh, effort aimed at trying to mitigate the spread of uh, COVID-19 uh, in those communities, uh, working in partnership with the leadership of those communities. And, I, uh, and, and I'm pleased to say, whereas during the peak of the epidemic, we were admitting about 10 or 15 patients from the city of Chelsea uh, a day. Uh, in the last week, I believe we had, have admitted just, just one. Um, COVID-19 uh, certainly underscored for us at Mass General the unfairness of our society and the fact that so many people who are uh, lower income communities, certain racial and ethnic groups, uh, just don't get a fair sh shake in our, uh, in our country. Um, and, uh, and I'm reminded of President Obama's uh, eulogy at yesterday's uh, funeral uh, for Congressman Lewis, where he reminded all of us that one of our most important duties as a country uh, is to create a more perfect uh, union. Well, we, we want to participate in that effort and we want to create a more perfect hospital in the wake of uh, what we've been through. That uh, desire has certainly been intensified by the tragic murders of George Floyd and others uh, that we've all painfully witnessed. Uh, and, uh, and so we, we are determined uh, to, uh, to really move the ball dramatically in the area of social justice and, and against uh, racism, uh, because we have a, not only responsibility to do it, but I think one of the most unique opportunities in our lifetime to make progress in this important uh, area. We were very fortunate about a year ago to appoint uh, Dr. Joe Betancourt as our Vice President for Equity and Inclusion. And we've had a diversity effort at the hospital for more than 20 years. And Joe sort of picked up the reins of the strategies that that uh, effort uh, had initiated, uh, but also in the last few months has had countless conversations with people throughout the organization, trying to think in light of uh, COVID-19, in light of George Floyd and others, what can we do as an institution to, uh, to make us a more perfect hospital and by doing so, try to make us a more uh, perfect union. So uh, we are very excited within the hospital and across our entire health system, now known as uh, Mass General Brigham, to really uh, aggressively uh, address this issue, and I'm pleased at this point to turn this uh, web webinar over to uh, to Joe Betancourt to describe our plans in more detail. Th thank you all so much. Great, thank you so much, Peter, and it's a real uh, honor and pleasure to get this opportunity to speak to everyone on the line. And I guess more importantly, it's an honor and pleasure to be on the on the line with uh, Drs. Armstrong and, and James, two people who I think. Um, uh, supported this effort uh, and the efforts that, that Peter articulated uh, in ways that were just incredible and deeply personal for me, as, as I'll explain uh, in a moment. And, and thanks to uh, uh, Britt as well for bringing us all together. So I guess very quickly, and, and I just have a short amount of time, I want to touch on three quick things. Um, one is, what did we see and why? Uh, two is, what did we do? And third is, where do we go from here? Uh, as Peter's articulated, there's no doubt that uh, the COVID pandemic has disproportionately impacted communities of color, not only locally, but across the country. This is not because these communities are, for some reason, more genetically susceptible to COVID. It's instead because many of these communities are vulnerable and disadvantaged due to, in fact, structural racism, other factors like being densely populated, the issues of multi-generational homes, uh, individuals in these uh, communities being essential workers, not having the the luxury to social distance, uh, needing to take the train before uh, we told people to take masks, to wear masks. And, and for all those reasons, uh, we have understood with a virus that spreads easy in a 10-day asymptomatic period, that those sets of conditions created a perfect storm for communities of color being disproportionately impacted uh, by COVID. And we saw it clearly here with Chelsea and Revere. Chelsea perhaps having, I think, the, one of the top 10 infection rates in the country, but we saw it in Queens, New York. We saw it in Detroit, New Orleans. Um, clearly, we're seeing it now uh, in places like Arizona, Florida, and uh, California, among, among many other places. So this crisis for communities of color and how it's disproportionately impacted them is far from over, uh, but we were able to uh, 
I think uh, identified early as Peter mentioned, where more than half of our patients with COVID were uh, Latino and coming from places like Chelsea and Revere. Uh, and uh, it was, uh, I think, an, an incredibly uh, painful uh, in general for all of us, but I would say deeply personal for me. I'm originally from Puerto Rico. I grew up in a bilingual home. You know, for me, uh, I had a chance to uh, address this pandemic from the community all the way to the bedside, managing it, you know, with patients. And I would just say that for us, uh, and for our community, people who understand the impact of race, ethnicity, culture, and class on health and health outcomes. Um, this was especially painful. It was something that we could have predicted, but I don't think uh, the magnitude is one which we understood. So uh, what, did we, what did we do about this? I'm, I'm pleased to say that we rallied very, very quickly as a system and as a hospital to do a lot of things to make sure that we weren't only just meeting the needs of people when they came to us, where a lot of our initial planning was, was developed making sure we had enough ventilators, enough beds, uh, but also really thinking about the importance of public health and public health infrastructure and community health. The idea that coming downstream and being ready for people when they come is not good enough. We need to be out in the community preventing spread. And we're pleased to say that we took a very robust effort uh, to address those sets of issues. Um, at the community health side, we worked in, in hotspot communities across our system doing a variety of things, increasing testing, broadening testing criteria, delivering care kits that had masks, sanitizer, information in multiple languages, working with cities and towns to set up isolation areas like hotels where individuals could uh, convalesce safely, uh, where we could take care of them if they were positive and they couldn't uh, go home safely without infecting their family members, communicating with them routinely via telephone to check on them to address their social needs. A large community health upstream effort, but also on the downstream side here, we work diligently from very early on uh, to meet the needs of our patients, particularly those with uh, limited English proficiency by standing up a Spanish language care group, a group of about 50 native Spanish speaking doctors who worked hand in hand with our surge teams to meet the needs of our uh, Spanish speaking patients, uh, working to make sure that all of our virtual activities that Peter has uh, articulated here, uh, that fundamentally due to a digital divide and other factors are not able to reach all of our patients that we are working on building those sets of connections. Uh, and we've started working on that early, but boy, do we have a long way to go to make sure that as we do more virtual, we're really meeting the needs of all our patients, not those who are digitally connected. We work to also meet the needs of our employees who didn't get information like I was getting it every day via email uh, or via Zoom. And so we stood up a text messaging platform for over 7,000 employees, uh, about 55,000 patients who weren't on Gateway. Uh, and so these were the types of things that we did in response uh, to the COVID pandemic and how it impacted uh, our vulnerable uh, communities and our employees who lived in those vulnerable communities. So I'll end by, by talking a bit about where we, where we go from here. On the heels of us doing, I think, a pretty magnificent job at, at uh, addressing the surge and coming down off the surge, May 25th, I think, again, um, once again, uh, illustrated what hundreds of years of racism and discrimination look like and how they continue to be an issue that we as a nation uh, have not reckoned with fully. And certainly we as a hospital have a long way to go uh, to reckon as well. And uh, post May 25th and the murder of George Floyd on the heels of multiple other murders, which I would argue didn't get as much press as his, but Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery and others, it's just a long list of, of individuals. This is not a one-off. Um, this was certainly a time where uh, people are more engaged around this issue. And we, as an institution, have committed to create a new, uh, reinvigorated, I would argue transformational, and I hope groundbreaking set of strategies to address structural racism inside and outside our walls. Uh, we've created and vetted extensively uh, what we're calling the Structural Equity 10-Point Plan that was presented to leadership on June 15th presented to our board uh, on July 17th, strongly endorsed, and now being reconciled with Mass General Brigham, but it does address a lot of different issues which we think are critical. But I wanna be clear, we focused a lot on diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, but we really need to understand that our emphasis here, the foundation of our work, needs to be built on a foundation of eliminating, identifying and eliminating all aspects of structural racism that exists today in our hospitals, including ours, ways uh, that might seem invisible to some, but are acutely painful to others. And they include ways in which uh, our environment is structured in which people don't feel valued, don't feel respected. Our victims oftentimes of uh, anywhere from racism to microaggressions and 
Uh, these are people who have grit, who have resilience, who care to do the right thing for their patients, but carry that burden every day with us. So how do we create an environment that's more supportive, be able to really live our values? That's a key component of this plan. I'd say a second part is you know, who we are as an institution. Certainly, uh, we, uh, like many healthcare institutions across the country, don't reflect the diversity of our nation nor our community. We are not missing by a little, we're missing by a lot. We've tried for a long time and made progress, but I would argue it's been drip, 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 and not at the scale or speed that any of us feel is appropriate. And so we are doubling down on diversity and governance, leadership uh, among our clinicians, nurses, and our entire institution. Uh, and then finally, uh, how do we reconceive um, who we are providing care to in our midst uh, and what communities we're really, um, uh, I think, in and, and we've built trust with, but also uh, doubling down on assuring that anybody who enters our door, no matter who they are or where they're from, gets the best care uh, we have to offer. Uh, so I'm excited about um, this uh, turning point for us. We clearly need the support of uh, all who are interested in uh, Mass General Hospital and uh, our leadership in our community and our leaders. And so uh, this story is yet to be told, but we hope that we put out and on the process of solidifying some real stakes and some real commitments uh, that will create a better day for Mass General around uh, racial equity. Um, so with that, I, I thank you so much uh, for this opportunity. And I'll turn it over to Dr. Armstrong. So Joe, thank you so much. And I just want to thank Britt and Peter for having this session and for everybody who's joining. We are so grateful for your support and your interest. This narrative is one of, as Peter says, the narratives that I'm most proud of as part of my time in the Mass General family. And I'm delighted to share a perspective from the Department of Medicine. So I joined the Mass General family actually about seven and a bit years ago now, at a time where we faced another crisis in Boston when we had the Boston Marathon bombing. And I think it was clear to me at that time how important it was that we focused on our community and not just how we were serving our community, as Joe put, because the leadership there has just been extraordinary, but also on our internal community. How was it that we were going to set standards of diversity, of equity, of an inclusion that really could lead the nation in thinking about that? And I'll just share that, you know, for me, there's a lot of reasons to do that. But I think one of them probably is most fundamental to me is really from, comes from my childhood. And so I grew up moving around a lot as a kid. But when I was 10, I moved from New York to Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Uh, that was, I guess, and maybe I shouldn't share when I was 10. I was thinking about that when Peter talked about how long he's been here. I think, Peter, you're giving it away a little. Uh, but let's just say that was some time ago in the 70s. And I can tell you the most striking lesson for me at that time was that that state was suffering so much. There was such a lack of economic opportunity for people. The opportunities for young people of any color were really relatively limited. But it was most striking that we at that time were excluding so much talent from solving those problems. The level of racism and segregation that existed meant that most of the people who brought the talent to taking on the future were really not at the table. And I think over the last decade, it's become increasingly clear from my perspective that wherever you look, whether you look in medicine or in business or in education, that it is about bringing the best talent to problems, about bringing people who can offer innovative and creative new ways of taking on problems that actually allows us to achieve in each part of our society, whether that means starting a business or actually for us leading healthcare. And so because of that, we've recognized increasingly that for us to deliver on the promise and on the trust that each of you puts into us to be the best possible place to get medical care, the best place to educate our future doctors, and the place to do the best possible research, as Peter said, for us to do that, we must bring the best talent that exists to these problems and to the future. And so in the department, we decided seven years ago to prioritize, as Joe has said, diversity, equity, and inclusion as really job one across what we were doing. 
We established a diversity and inclusion board under the leadership of Sherry Ann Burnett Bowie. And we spend a lot of time trying to understand, and Joe has done this work across the country in just such an incredible way. What are the barriers to achieving this vision? And I guess I wanna share with you some of our journey as we've dug into those barriers and our hope that you'll be part and continue to help us move this work. So I think we discovered, as Joe said, that an enormous amount is important about the culture, about the environment that people are working in. And the plan that Joe has articulated to address some of the structural issues within our environment is really inspirational to all of us. And so making this a place where people feel respected, comfortable, I think able to be who they are, to be a black woman and a doctor, to be Latino, to be a trans individual and to deliver care in an ICU, to know that they feel safe and respected in every part of their job. We discovered that not only were we dealing with a lot of concerns about race, about gender, about LGBT issues, but we had a huge issue also with disability. People with disabilities feeling valued and respected and able to contribute. And so that work under Joe and in the department is making daily progress, but I know it'll be a journey for all of us across the country until we're sure that every single person feels respected, feels safe in the places that they work. I think we also recognize that for people to join us, they needed to have role models and mentorship to be able to find people who looked like them and could speak to their experiences. And so we spend an extraordinary amount of effort trying to bring in to our faculty, to our institution, individuals like Joe, like others, who really can set a tone, but also provide an individual level connection. So that when you move from another city, you come to a place like Boston where everybody seems to have been born here. And if they didn't go to Harvard all the way along, somebody in their family did. That you can find people who've made their home here, who understand what an incredible place Mass General is and who wrap their arms around you and support you when you're not sure what to do. But I want to end about something that I think I've learned over the last seven years that is absolutely critical to us if we are going to achieve this vision of actually bringing the best talent to our missions, to our ability to deliver clinical care, to our research, our education, and our community. And that is, I think we have to recognize just how difficult it is to move to Boston and to live in Boston without significant personal and family wealth. It was unbelievable to me to learn about two years ago that for a, one of my residents, let's say they make about $60,000 a year, that translates into a take home pay, let's say of about $4,000 a month, maybe a little bit more. And that if they have a child, they're spending about $1,700 of that a month on one child childcare. If you want a one bedroom apartment, that's another $1,700. And so that means that we're leaving our workforce often with some four or $500 a month to be able to fill all those, those other gaps. And so I've been so excited about the programs that Peter has led, that MGB is leading to provide both the environment that Joe is talking about, to provide the mentorship and the role models that I'm responsible for bringing to this institution, but also to increasingly understand is how can we make this actually a viable place for people to come to live and to raise families. Because it's that ability that I think will be increasingly critical for us to ensure that the talent comes and stays here. And so I'll just end, you know, that from my perspective, for us to take this issue on is going to require an all hands on deck approach. It's one of the issues that we've struggled with in our country and in academic medicine and in all of healthcare for a very long time. And I think it's an incredible moment as I've seen the response to COVID-19 
when across the country, I think we've come to recognize that without our health or our health care, as we say, there's really not much else. There's not much of an economy. There's not much more than we can do if we can't ensure that our families and everybody we care for is healthy. And to be able to understand what it means to be a person of color and recognize that that level of safety and security for the health of your family has been missing for so long. And then to understand how an institution like Mass General can stand up and lead at a time like this, both to think about caring for our communities and our patients, but also for creating a Department of Medicine, a Mass General that values all diversity, that makes sure that when we bring somebody to our community that we're doing everything we can to help them succeed and that we make those changes as we move forward. So I've been thinking a lot about how I can um, move and support the next generation because I know that the greatest thing that I can do for all of you on this call and for all of the patients who come in is to support the residents and the young people to develop the future cures, to become the doctors who we all need. And so I could not be more delighted to introduce to you one of those people. Dr. Aisha James is an inspiration to me every day. She led the department with her colleagues through the COVID response of the last, um, as Peter says, it feel, Peter said five months, I will say it feels like longer, Peter. But she led the department through that period. And I am convinced that it is with her leadership and with her peers that we're going to have reached a tipping point in this journey, not only for Mass General, but really for medicine across our country. And that we are gonna have move forward on a vision for equity that is gonna make us all so proud of this moment in time and what we came together to do. So Dr. James, thank you so much for everything that you do for our patients and for the department, but for joining us here today. Thank you so much, Dr. Armstrong. That was a very, very kind introduction. And I just wanna thank everybody for allowing me to be on this webinar. I feel incre incredibly privileged to be on this webinar with so many people I look up to who are leaders at our institution and really within medicine. And I'm happy to have this opportunity to share a little bit about what it is to be a junior faculty here at MGH and be a newer member of the community. So like Dr. Armstrong and Nicholson mentioned, I'm a new primary care doctor here at MGH. I just finished my residency in internal medicine and pediatrics um, and did my year as a chief, one of the chief residents for the Department of Medicine. So this June, so I just ended in June and started July at MGH Everett Family Care, where I am practicing primary care. And prior to coming to Boston for residency training, I actually was in New York City. I lived there first as a special education teacher and then did my medical school there. And one of the things I really loved about being in New York is that I got to care for a very diverse group of students and then later patients as a medical student. And witnessing is the unequal access that they had to health and safety really strengthened my interest in social justice and solidified my desire to dedicate my medical career to promoting health equity and caring for vulnerable populations. So as I finished medical school and was starting to look to residency, I do have to say that MGH was actually not that high on my list because I didn't think of it necessarily as an institution that was focused on equity or caring for vulnerable populations. And then when I came to interview, I had such a wonderful experience. I was really connected with the people I interviewed with and was so impressed by the really rigorous clinical training. And I also had the opportunity to spend time at the Center for Diversity and Inclusion or the CDI. And this is an organization that's been at MGH for over 20 years that brings together physicians of color to create a community and space for us. And so I felt really welcome there. And so I made the decision to come to MGH. And my plan was to become the best clinician possible and work with experts in the field. And then I still thought that I actually was going to leave MGH at the end of my training and practice medicine at an institution that I thought was going to be more focused on serving vulnerable populations and social justice. And I was very pleasantly surprised, though, when I came here to train, that very quickly I met so many colleagues who were equally passionate about social justice, and I was able to build this network of colleagues and activists and really work to promote social justice at our institution. We brought 
you know, anti-racism education to our program. We launched advocacy campaigns within the hospital, arranged meetings with legislators at the state house, which is just down the road, to promote policies to promote the health of vulnerable patients um, in Massachusetts. You know, I attended protests with many of my colleagues wearing our white coats and using our privilege and voices as physicians to fight for gun safety and to fight for racial justice. Um, and then sort of as Dr. Betancourt was mentioning, being able to come together as an MGH community during the COVID-19 crisis and really focus a bunch of efforts on the most vulnerable population. So it's been amazing to create that community here at MGH. In addition to all of my peers um, and mentors dedicated to social justice, I also found a really wonderful community at the CDI. And the CDI has really been a home for me within MGH and a place where I can come together with other physicians of color to talk about shared experiences and support one another. And that's just been so valuable. And so because of these reasons, I have decided to stay at MGH and build my career here. And I'm excited to be working particularly though at MGH Everett because there I am able to care for a more diverse patient population than I did um, many times while I was on my inpatient rotations. And so there are so many wonderful things about practicing here and there are still things that make me frustrated. Um, you know, many of my Black and Latinx colleagues here work in environmental services or nutrition and most of them are not nurses or doctors. And it can often be really lonely being the only member of color on a team. It's like not rare for me to be on an inpatient service and I am the only black or Latinx person. And that's when I take into account the nurses and the consulting teams and the physical therapists and even the patients. And so, you know, one thing that I hope and I'm looking forward to is sort of building up the diversity of our healthcare workforce at MGH. And so sort of similarly, it does sadden me that MGH does not care for many of the black and Latinx community within the Boston area. Um, and I know that we provide such amazing health care, and I think that we could be leaders in sort of addressing the health disparities in the Boston community by improving access and welcoming sort of those populations to MGH. So I will say over the past four, five months, like people mentioned, I have gone through a roller coaster of emotions from being really like deeply depressed and saddened to now I'm on like the other end where I'm feeling a lot more hopeful and excited. Um, and I think it's because of the commitment of the leaders on this call who, and the greater MGH community who I can really see have a new um, energy and focus on racial justice and the justice really for all vulnerable um, populations. And I think that, you know, if we maintain this momentum, we're going to really be able to um, make MGH an even more incredible place to work and an even more incredible place for our patients. Um, so with that, I will pass it back to Dr. Nic Dr. Nicholson for some questions. Dr. James, thank you very much. Uh, and we've had several uh, questions that have already come through the question and answer box. And uh, even though you just finished talking, I'm going to direct the first one to you. Okay. Uh, the question is that yesterday on Boston.com, an article was published featuring a story of a Brigham and Women's Physicians essay on professionalism and what it means for black physicians. She cites that she's always separated her work in medicine from the color of her skin. But upon recent events across the country and globe, she's reached a breaking point. And so the question to you is, how do we work more closely with the doctors who express similar sentiments? Thank you for that question. And I also read that article and it was really powerful and really resonated with me and I connected with it so much. I think that one piece, I think there are probably two things that would be helpful and I definitely don't know the perfect way to handle this. But one is creating spaces to allow um, physicians of color to come together to share these experiences. And I think that for me, the CDI has created that place, space for me, but I think we need to you know, do that more so that people with these shared experiences can come together and support one another. I also think we need to provide tools for everyone, both physicians of color and our allies, to be able to sort of step up when we witness in, like incidences of prejudice. Because in the moment, if you're the person receiving 
you know, any sort of aggression, whether macro or micro, can be really hard to react. And having a colleague, like, have a script or, like, know how to intervene and support you, um, I think would make all the difference. And that's not easy, easy, I think, for an ally either. So I think we need to create training so people have that toolkit so that you like know what to say. And I think that will really create a lot more um, a welcoming experience so to, for everyone, our colleagues, and then also I think for our patients. Great. Uh, Joe, I'm going to direct the next one to you. Um, uh, how does or will the hospital ensure diversity, inclusion, and cultural competence training takes place across areas throughout the hospital? And how do you maintain this over the long term? Joe, you're, you're on mute. Um, it's a great question, and thank you for that. And, and so, you know, I think fundamentally, um, so I've been here for almost 20 years and in this role for about a year. And, and I'll tell you that for me, as I've met with leaders across the institution, there is no doubt that we have uh, very, very great intentions and uh, very, very strong aspirations for uh, who we want to be. I think fundamentally the, the gap that, that has uh, existed is a gap between aspiration and execution and bringing the rigor and all the excellence that we apply um, that includes setting targets, goals, timelines, accountability, transparency, oversight, everything we do that makes this institution, I think, so phenomenal and so able to be high performance and execute at a high level in everything we do, I believe that um, we have not applied that same rigor uh, to this portfolio of work. And uh, fundamentally, if this will be a transformational process for us, if, if, if this story ends well for us, uh, a key part of this story will be that we will no longer um, hope and aspire but we will guarantee, hold accountable, uh, and uh, really achieve uh, in, in much, much better ways at scale and at a, at a much faster speed, a lot of the things that are critical. That will require sacrifices, um, you know, carrots and sticks, mandating certain things. I mean, we really need to stand behind our values, I believe, in ways that, that we haven't before. So I think we have an incredible substrate here. It's how do we activate that substrate? and you know, it will. This is, Katrina mentions, mentions the issue of resources. As we try to recruit people, um, it, you know, resources play a role. As we try to develop educational, you know, platforms like, like uh, Aisha mentions around bystander training, that requires resources. And, and we're in a very resource constrained time. So this is about building rigor, uh, but it's also about resourcing that, that rigor appropriately. And that's the journey I'm, I'm hoping we'll embark on uh, in the weeks and months to come. Uh, Peter, a uh, question came in that says, to what degree do health insurance issues stand in the way of connecting with and assisting the underserviced and marginalized populations in your community? Is it a barrier to your aspiration to make a real difference? And given the current financial challenges imposed by the COVID pandemic, uh, 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 F -F -F you know, pandemic, uh, Will it be more difficult uh, to address these issues? I, I think um, insurance has been one of the issues that has uh, present, made it more difficult for certain segments of the population in our society to receive care at, at Mass General. Uh, some of that, frankly, is due to the wishes of other provider organizations that want their patients to stay within their midst and don't want um, them to quote unquote, leak to Mass General for a specialty and tertiary care. Part of it though is um, our, our own doing. I mean, I think within our contracting efforts, we've tried to achieve certain prices uh, that are necessary to cover the costs uh, within the hospital and the physician's organization. Sometimes those prices are just not affordable within uh, contracts or, or insurance products, for example, that uh, serve patients who get their insurance through the connector. Um, but I think in, in light, I mean, there have been a number of us who have been pushing back on those policies, but I think in light of what's happened in the last few months, those policies have dissolved, and I think our organization is going to do its best to participate in all, all products, regardless of the financial uh, implications. 
most of those products want us to accept Medicaid rates. Medicaid pays hospitals in this state about a th two thirds of their costs. We lose about 40 cents on the dollar for every Medicaid patient that we uh, care for, but we just need to figure out a way to cross subsidize that care. Uh, and so we're gonna do our very best uh, as part of this initiative to, um, to make sure that insurance is no longer a barrier to people receiving care at Mass General or across our health system. Uh, Katrina, uh, it's hard to uh, overestimate the importance of role models. How does the leadership demonstrate that they value diversity, equity, and inclusion? And how do they ensure that their commitment cascades throughout the organization? Fred, thanks so much. I think that's such an important question. And I think that that's something that um, we've all been talking a lot about. I think one of the analogies that I remember is um, probably when I was about Aisha's age um, was when I think the healthcare system really woke up to the issues of quality and safety. Um, and all of a sudden we realized that actually there were ways and that was kind of those years as you guys may remember where there was all so much concern about the number of errors that might be happening. And what I've been struck by has been incredible is that since then, the healthcare system across the US has essentially transformed. And now Peter, when I join his leadership meetings every Wednesday morning, we open with a moment on quality and safety. And so Britt, I think that there's a number of ways that we need to change how we behave as leaders to make sure that diversity and equity becomes job one. One is I do think at each leadership meeting, making sure that it's clear, and we just had a division chiefs meeting yesterday where we open now talking about whatever the equity um, priority is. For us, it is a new job description right now about having a diversity leader in each division within the Department of Medicine. But so to make sure that at every meeting, it's not an afterthought, it is actually at the front of the agenda. And I think that's been a comment and a commitment that's been made widely. I think the challenge with that is I think, and it may be Joe who brought it up, is that those, that really mostly helps if we are able to also change who's in the meetings. And so that means a completely new approach to how we bring diverse leadership into meetings. Questioning our assumptions, I think as Peter has brought up about what types of degrees or titles or even promotion levels mean that you should sit in a room or not really thinking about making sure that every room we have has diverse leadership, not just across color of skin, but really people with different perspectives, who've had different experiences, because that is what will make it absolutely clear. And then, you know, my own personal perspective, Brett, is that we have to feel comfortable talking about these issues talking about the fact that as I think your first question to Dr. James said, how hard it is to be a person of color in medicine, to be able to come together as leaders and be able to talk about race, to talk and understand how challenging that can be to be a person of color in, a, in an institution that um, is unable to talk about how difficult that is. So I think it's bringing people here it's prioritizing those issues in every meeting. It's changing who's in the room. But then it's this growing comfort that we all have now with recognizing that this issue has never, it's been with us since this country was created. So the issue isn't new. It's how do we really start talking about it in a way that we can heal those wounds and move things forward. Peter, I'm going to give you the last question, and once you finish, you know, let you wrap up. Uh, uh, a, uh, one of the participants asked, can, uh, can you speak to how important diversity is to you, and what value does it bring to the MGH's mission from your perspective? Um, it, it is uh, extraordinarily important to me. Um, first of all, if you look at the history of the MGH, I think embedded in our DNA is is a commitment to social justice. Uh, we were created to care for the disadvantaged uh, people in our society. We were the first hospital in the country to establish a hospital-based social service department 
recognizing that uh, it was futile to care for people in the hospital and then send them out to adverse social conditions in the community. That having been said, there has definitely, for at Mass General and throughout our society, been a, a gap between what we pontificate and what we practice on a day-to-day -day basis. That's touched my family because it's only been in the last quarter or third of Mass General's history, history that we've been willing to train Jewish physicians. That came as a shock to me when I realized that, but uh, that's an example of how for most of the history of this hospital, we have excluded a sick we excluded a certain segment of our population from training opportunities. So we always need to commit ourselves to making Mass General a better hospital, um, and, and we're, we're determined to do so. Uh, I guess there are two other reasons why this is so important to me beyond just my commitment to social justice. Uh, one is that if, if we don't have a workforce that is reflective of the increasingly diverse population that we're trying to serve, I think from a more crass business standpoint, we're putting the whole organization at risk. So we need diversity to, uh, so that uh, people of all segments of our society will want to be, be willing and interested in receiving care at Mass General. And then picking up on a point that Katrina made earlier, I think the third reason why this is so important to me is that Mass General is a better hospital, a higher quality hospital, if we are a more diverse and equitable uh, institution. Uh, I've certainly seen, as we have um, made some progress in diversifying the senior management team at the hospital, that we make better decisions because of the varied uh, perspectives around the table. Um, and, 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 I th and, and I think that same principle applies throughout the institution. We will make better decisions, be a better institution, if we have a, a range of uh, people with different backgrounds, beliefs, values around the table trying to... Uh, figure out what's uh, the, the path ahead. So for all of those reasons, Britt, this is an incredibly important issue for me. I also know it's an incredibly important issue for our board of trustees that Katrina serves on. And, uh, and so we are deeply committed to, uh, to using, taking advantage of this unique opportunity and life of this hospital, the life of our country to make uh, enormous progress on, on this front. So I, I guess I just want to close by thanking my fellow panelists for uh, for participating in this uh, session and for, for and also obviously thanking all of our viewers for your interest in this topic, your interest in our hospital, and your support of this hospital as well. So I hope you found this uh, discussion uh, interesting and informative, and uh, and look forward to seeing you hopefully in person in the not too distant future. Thank you all so much.